welcome to the RK Photographic Patterns Festival workshop follow-up screencast. Anybody who came on the workshops at Patterns Festival, uh, apart from the day that we couldn't get out with a camera because it absolutely tonked it down with rain, would have had a uh, sort of time out with a camera around the site where we learnt some technical skills for anybody who wanted them, but uh, also had quite a lot of consideration into the concept of creativity and vision and defining how you kind of personalise your photography a little bit. Now, the accompanying webcast to go with this uh, will be the discussion on creativity and vision, uh, and that will be online too. This screencast uh, is to give you, as we did in the sort of second 45 minutes of the Patterns Festival workshop, a flavour of how I use Adobe Photoshop Lightroom to process my images and to actually create my vision within post-processing. Uh, should It's not designed as a completely in-depth, show-you-everything um, version of sort of screencast of Lightroom with some of the plugins from Nixoft, but it, it'll give you a flavour and hopefully help you decide whether Lightroom or, and all the Nick plugins are for you. Uh, obviously, you can go online anyway at the moment to, on adobe.com and you can get a free month's trial of Lightroom. Uh, well worth anybody who's thinking about it having a look at that. And similarly, you can go on to Google and if you search the Google Nick plugins, it'll take you to the to the website now since Google purchased the company. And the set of plugins and filters where they were awfully expensive individually, probably talking around £700 for the complete set. Uh, since Google have bought them out, you can now get the complete Nick suite for give or take about sort of £90, £100, depending on the exchange rate. So it's definitely worth having a look at. Uh, and again, you might decide it's for you, you might decide it's not. But without further ado, what we're going to do is get into the screencast and have a look at how I use Lightroom and how you might be able to use it to simplify your workflow and help you get the dramatic results you're after um, in relatively easy steps. Now, for me, Lightroom is quite a, is a really easy piece of software to work with. Um, it's fairly intuitive, and once you've had a little overview of the it's kind of the screen and how the old dashboard works. It becomes really, really, really commonsensical, so you shouldn't have too many issues. Okay, so once we've opened uh, Adobe Lightroom, the first thing we want to go and do is to import our pictures, because as well as being an, an image processing tool, you can also use it very effectively as a sort of an image management or cataloging tool. Um, we're not going to look at, go into too much of that today, that'll be one for a later podcast on the website. But I'll just show you how you import your files. Obviously the first thing you're going to do is bring them off your camera, pop them on your PC, so import them onto a folder on your PC. Uh, different people manage their folder structures in different ways. So take that uh, and use that how you actually, how it makes sense to you. But um, Again, please please try and if you can import them onto your PC first, uh, and ensure you've got a backup at least on the PC. And maybe I would I would certainly advocate using a second location as well, uh, external to your PC, whether that be an external hard drive or a cloud service, just to ensure that you've got data resilience. There'd be nothing worse than a hard drive corrupting or a memory card corrupting and finding out that you've lost all your photos from that kind of chance of a lifetime trip to the Great Barrier Reef or to Iceland or somewhere like that. So the first thing we're going to do when we've opened Lightroom, and it'll look, I'm doing it on a Mac, but it'll look very, very similar on a Windows PC. Um, so you go to File, and we can go to Export, or we can go straight down here to the bottom of the left-hand user panel and click on our Export button. Both give us cancel, not export, import. So as I say, file, and we can import photos and video straight from the top menu, or we can do an import straight from here. So it's obviously one of the quicker ways of doing it. So I'm gonna click import. This will take me to my folder structure on the PC. You'll see here it shows the internal drive of the computer, Macintosh HD. Uh, it'll also show any external drives you have attached. So if you've got any attached to your PC regularly, they'll also always show there and they'll show the folder structure. We've used the um, external hard drive that I backed up to whilst we were away. 
and you could have a look down into one of your folders and find your pictures. Now what Lightroom is very good at is you'll notice these ones are greyed out These because these ones are ones that I've imported already. So that kind of makes our life a little bit easier in that we're not duplicating the images that we bring into Lightroom. So the other thing I can do is I can look in another folder on here and try and find what the pictures we have. So I could drop down to here and when, when we were away I had a colleague and a close friend of mine who came on the sort of March photographer's break with me uh, and we hit many of the fantastic locations that we will be going to in November again this year, March next year and November the year after. I currently have one space left on all of those workshops at the moment and that's for March 2015. For anybody who's interested have a look on the website www.rkphotographic.com and head into the workshop section and look at the North Yorkshire Photographers Residential. Here you can see Paul got some fantastic images from many of the locations that we actually visited that day. Some very, very similar ones to some of the images that I made. Let's see, I mean, the main reason I'm just showing you this folder quickly, we're not going to import these ones, but if you have a look at this, all the pictures we've looked at in this folder, they're not greyed out, because these aren't photos that I've actually imported already into Lightroom. Obviously with these being Paul's photographs that I backed up for him while we're away, I'm not going to be importing these ones. These, these are going to be images for that Paul certainly worked with, and if you follow Paul on Twitter, uh, or Flickr, you'll, you'll have seen some of his images out there. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to assume that I've imported my photos and they come into the catalogue as, as we see here. Now any photos that um, I've processed already you'll see kind of appear in that output format. So here we can see I've processed this one already. This is one that I think I've demonstrated on the Patchings workshop and double clicking on any of the photos will take you into the view. You can also press F to go full screen which will give us a really nice full screen presentation of the image with none of the clutter at the side which can often be a very very good tool for assessing which photos we want to process in the first place and which photos that once we're processing them where, where we are with the processing can pop it against a nice uncluttered background and we'll press F again that'll take us back into normal view. So I'm going to go into grid view here. I'm going to find a photo to process for the purposes of this morning's demonstration. So we'll have a look down the list and I think what we'll do th what we'll do in the first instance we'll uh, we'll take on a couple of different images uh, depending on the couple kind of styles that we're going to try and process for and some of the plugins we'll use. So in the first instance we'll perhaps look at uh, maybe a nice sort of warm classic landscape scene. So we'll have a quick look at this one, see if this meets sort of the requirements. Nice seascape image here. Uh, this was taken at uh, Skinning Grove just to the to the left of the jetty which is in sort of Teesside. Uh, another lovely location to go photograph. It's, if you arrive at the location you'd be um, a little bit shocked to start with. Kind of, it looks a little bit kind of run down in places but uh, once you get through this it's uh, this absolute massive kind of opportunity for the photographer. So excellent location to visit. Uh, here we've as you can see from my settings, I've used a slightly, not a massively long shutter speed, so we've we've just gone to capture a little bit of the motion whilst maintaining some of the energy in this water of a sixth of a second f11. Shot this at 40 mils, uh, and the thing that attracted me about this was the it was early morning. We've got some lovely kind of blue tones coming through in the water because the early morning light, but as the sun had risen and uh, moved around the other side of the of the jetty, there was some lovely light on these sort of ironstone cliffs that stretch away towards sort of the peninsula and around Saltburn. And so I've got a lovely colour balance here between the lovely oranges of the sun on the ironstone and the cool blues of the water. So we're going to process this image as I think we'll we'll take this one as 
something of a, a classic landscape image and uh, rather than trying to be too moody on this one so this this will be the kind of the classic landscape so we bring our image in we select the one we want to work with if we if we know we're definitely going to kind of output this file I would tend to hear I might choose a title straight away what you might find is that you're not sure of a title and putting your details in until you've processed this image and the next thing I might do with my images is I flip into the map module which plugs into Google Maps and just as a, a nice way of allowing me to understand where I made my images I will often map them using the map functionality on Lightroom which says plugged into Google Maps as you can see here we're down in Skinny Grove here's the, the kind of jetty and the, the slope ran up to the old steelworks on top of the hill uh, I was somewhere down here looking sort of very much down the coast in this direction towards the cliffs that start to jut out here and as we, we kind of head around this side it brings us down into Saltburn that gives you some kind of understanding of where we are the, the kind of the hill up here the railway line that runs around and the old fan house is kind of the back of back end of Broughton again up in Teesside obviously so we're going to zoom in into the location where we've got our image I love Google Maps for this because it's, it's really good it's accurate and it allows us a really clear quick visual representation of where we made our images I'm going to zoom in and I know I was roughly kind of along here as, as the water crashed in here and the simple thing we do is once we've once we're happy with the location we've zoomed into so we're gonna, we'd right simply right click the mouse and we get a little pop-up that says add GPS coordinates to selected photos so we'll click on that with the left button and that will add these GPS coordinates to the image so I then flip into the develop module and this is the module within Lightroom that allows us to do most of our work we see here we've got the histogram which represents kind of the histogram that we discussed in camera so again we continue our processing being mindful of the histogram and ensuring we, we, we make note of sort of any clipping on either side and try and compensate for this depending on the, the visual style that we're actually working for okay so the first thing I would do and as I said to a lot of you on the workshop is that Lightroom itself the panel works very good and it's in an almost sequential order so we kind of work top down all the way down right hand side panels towards the bottom now absolutely yes fine that's brilliant the one clear thing that Adobe did wrong for me was they put one of the really really important <coughs> features on this right hand panel in a really illogical position for me uh, something that I would always do before I start doing my major processing because it, it affects the image right from the start so and that will scroll down quite a way quite a way down till we get to the lens correction section of Lightroom now this is where all different lenses the manufacturers send in their lens data to Adobe to allow corrections to be made in the software to compensate for barrel distortion, vignetting, chromatic aberration, any of the artifacts that are created by different types of lenses and this varies wildly between lenses and the simple thing we need to do here is literally tick enable profile corrections and what Adobe Lightroom will do is it will look into the EXIF data that's the data that's encoded into your file by your camera when it writes it to the memory card and you will actually find out what camera and what lens you used and it will apply the appropriate corrections to your image so if we click there and we'll see that the image changed we lost a little bit of vignette in on the corner and a little bit of the color kind of enhanced a little bit and it wasn't quite so dark so I've unticked it again we'll click it back there you go so off um, you can see that makes quite an interesting difference to the images the other thing that's also going to correct for is the distortion and the curvature on horizons 
And this is one of the key reasons where I like to actually use this functionality before I start doing all my processing. Because once you've got into cropping the photo and taking it down, if you then apply your lens corrections, after you've done all your other processing, if you work top to bottom, what you would find is it, <coughs> is it will make some changes that you might not be happy with and it will completely change the balance of how you process this image. So it's just for me a reason why I don't always do it at the start. The other thing I'll always tick, uh, and again we don't really need to know the kind of wizardry behind Adobe's magic here, is the remove chromatic aberrations. And this is where the software will look at your image as you process it and removes that kind of colour fringe in that you'll get sometimes on high contrast and, defini and definitive line areas in your image. Now thankfully you don't get too much on the Canon 5D Mark II. Uh, certainly at, at low ISO, I'm shooting at uh, ISO 50 on most of my work and you don't get too much but uh, it can be a lifesaver and it saves you doing a lot of work afterwards. There are a lot of other things you can do in this panel and certainly if you're working with architectural photography or you've got buildings in your images it can be an excellent panel for using to actually look at the kind of straightening verticals which is something in the past we had to spill out and go to um, Photoshop to do. So again, look what Adobe have done, they've brought it inside Lightroom and tried to simplify our workflow. So we've applied the lens profiles and we'll now go back up to the top of the screen. And the next thing I do is I set my black and white points. Now they, what this is going to do is allow us to set um, it's almost our contrast, so and our dynamic range of the image and this was set so to the, the extent of our deepest black and the extent of our brightest white. So we've got two sliders here. Now in the past you may have used exposure and contrast. I do use these very sparingly if I'm being quite creative but invariably on the classic landscape shot where we're looking for quite a faithful representation of the landscape what I will do is I will use purely the white and the black point to set my contrast and my dynamic range. And again, the more you've done in camera in terms of using filters to help you balance the um, the scene, so what we've done here is I've used a graduated filter on the sky area to help me balance it with the foreground, uh, so which has allowed us to pick some of these lovely kind of little bits of light up throughout the scene. Whereas maybe if we'd not used a set of um, graduated filters to actually balance this for us what we might have find that the sky was a little bit more blown out or we'd have had to merge again two photos in Photoshop to actually get a, a representation and a one for the sky and one for the foreground but uh, use it, certainly using your filters and I use a set of filters by a company called Lee uh, who are and they're optically fantastic filters. They're a little bit more expensive, a lot of the round screw-on ones, certainly, but and they're a lot a little bit more expensive than some of the cheaper brands, but certainly Lee filters uh, for me of the optical quality, which actually means that if I'm putting something in the front of my glass, my lens, that I don't want to actually put something down if I've got you know a lens that's of excellent quality. What I don't want to do is then put cheap plastic or cheap filters in front of it because it's going to then degrade what my lens can do. So I'll always look for the best quality filters and for me leaf filters are those. You can buy yourself a starter kit, uh, have a look online um, and which will get you going and the other advantage of the square slot in filters is you just literally need an appropriate sized adapter for the end of each of your lenses which are perhaps 20, 25, 30 pounds at most and you can then use your all your filters on the same lenses. Now, if you if you maybe be in the past bought Coke in screw on filters, you might have found you were sort of spending sixty seventy pounds per filter. So if you kind of take that across all your lenses, and you want maybe sort of ND filters, graduated filters, uh, extreme neutral density filters, skylight filters, um, polarizers you can start to see that soon starts to add up if you want to use it a system across multiple lenses. So actually the economics of using the leaf filters at that point actually become really good because you're using the one same set of filters across all your lenses just with the investment in an attached sort of lens, lens ring to 
to make them work for all your lenses. Okay, so well, less about the filters anyway, and we'll move move on to the processing. So as I say, I, I tend to work on my whites and my blacks. And what we'll do, rather than just, I could use the white and black slider and actually try and make a visual representation of the image as I look at it, bearing sort of having a little glance at the um, at the histogram as we do it. But what again, what Adobe have done, and they've introduced a feature which makes this really easy for us. So if I hold on to my Alt key on the PC or the Mac, and I grab my white slider, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move my, my slider bar to the right. Now if you watch the screen, it's gone black. Now it's not taking away your picture. What it's doing is it's giving a representation of where we're going to start to see our brightest white. And if you, again, if you look at your histogram above, what you'll see as we move this, the histogram moves and what we're aiming for is we're going to move the whites to the right until the histogram starts to touch the right hand edge of the screen which is again something we try and do in camera shooting for the right but also what we'll see on the black of the images we'll start to see some of these whites start to appear as either white or blue marks now what we do is once once they appear that means at that point and again if you look over at your histogram you'll see that the little triangle on the top right hand side of the histogram is now blue, that means we've clipped some highlights. So what we do is we now move it back very slightly, so it's literally goes to the point where just before we brought in the clipped highlights. And we let go. Now that, again, that will set as our white point. So we've got a nice, good dynamic range. We're stretching the histogram across the length of, or, or we're setting the, stretching the peaks across the length of our histogram. We've gone to the right hand side and we haven't clipped. We'll then set our black point, and again we hold the Alt key down, and the screen will go white this time. And what we do is we move the slider to the left until we start to see some blacks appearing. And what I will often tend to do is, because I do like to see some deep dark shadows, is I might push the blacks a little bit further than the whites. Now it's your choice. You can again, you can use the same rule as you did for the whites and literally just set that kind of basic exposure or you can push it a little bit further if you like a nice deep contrast. So I'm just going to have a little bit of deep shadow around the rocks in the water in the midground. And again, our histogram reflects this movement, and we let go. So the, these rocks here are the ones that have now got some deep dark shadowing in, which is area which will have sort of no detail in. But uh, what we do, uh, what I do like to see, and it's some acceptance that um, you know shadows are very dark, and it, and they do add quite some interest and mood and, and a little bit of concept to the scene. So we're going to work with that. But this again, this will be something that everybody works on in different ways. So we're going to move this move down now very slightly. Uh, in the same panel here on the right side, you've also got your highlights and your shadow sliders. Now these can be fan absolutely fantastic if you have got burnt out areas and you've not got any filters to actually do recovery. So if you've got burnt out highlights, you would literally move that to the left and you watch your histogram move to the left and what you'll see is you can start to recover some data in lost highlights as long as it's not completely blown out. I mean Lightroom is fantastic as it is now but you know there are it does still have its limitations and again the shadows one if you move that to the right that's going to start to bring some light back into the shadows so I mean we could reintroduce some light if you watch the picture in general brightens up but if you if we pushed it extremely, you could see that those rocks now have kind of an, an odd amount of light to them. You can see how powerful it is. So what I might decide to do here is I'll bring a little bit of bring a little bit of light back into these rocks, not too much. Okay, then we move down again. That's what we said. We keep moving down the right slider, and you've got a number of sliders here to help set your presence. Now clarity for me tends to be can be quite destructive. Um, on certainly on a classic landscape image, it's really good for us kind of adding micro contrast and bringing out details. So again, you've got to hit, you've got to be quite careful on what you're trying to do on on a scene that has a lot of rock or metal or stone or brickwork in it. It can be brilliant on bringing out that detail. 
but if you're actually working with a seascape or a landscape with a sky above it, what it might do is add a little bit too much kind of a bit of an uneasy crisp to the sky or the water. So again, this is something I use very, very sparingly. Probably less so on a classic landscape than I might on some images. And here, this is where I'm using it for creative effect. So what I will tend to do is just have a little look at the clarity. I mean, if you see here, if I just push it all the way to the right, you can see how unnatural it becomes. If I pushed it to the left, you can all, almost get that kind of blurry kind of autumn effect. Um, but what I'm going to do just kind of middle it. Any of these sliders, if you're unhappy with the position, so I've moved it here, if you double click on the actual slider bar, it pushes it back to the zero point, where, which was the default point the tool was at when you came in. So I'm just going to push it maybe a little bit, just to concentrate the, a little bit more detail on this flowing water in the foreground and the rocks without making the sky look too broken up. Next slider is obviously a vibrant slider. This is where, and your saturation slider, this is where we can work with the color tones, uh, the color depth, and we can actually use again this quite creatively, but we can use it to recreate the scene that we saw in front of us. As some cameras, and depending on the make, will give a slightly different color representation to what to what we actually see. And each camera will vary slightly from manufacturer to manufacturer. So what I tend to do is I'll, I'll just have a little look here. And I'll, certainly, as I know that the, the cliffs in the foreground were a really nice deep red because of the sun casting on the iron rich cliffs. So, what I might do is just enhance that a little bit, not too much, just to kind of play on it. If you, if you can see if I go too far, it brings a really uneasy colour into the blue and it, get, and, and it looks unnatural. And if I go the other way, you can almost create quite a, quite a toneful monochrome image. So, what I'm going to do is going to on my zero point again. And I'm just going to push this a little bit to concentrate on these cliffs in the foreground. Just get them nice and warm as I remember seeing them that morning. It's not caused too much effect on the water. You've got a little, it's enhanced this iron here, at least kind of the iron slag that was dropped off, been kind of dumped on the beach from the factory up on the top. I tend not to mess with the saturation a great deal. Often for a classic landscape, what I might find myself doing is actually decreasing the saturation. Again, maybe this is just how I kind of picture a landscape or my feeling as, as to how the modern digital cameras represent landscapes compared to how films did. I'll then move down now. Anybody who's used Photoshop, you'll be uh, well aware of how uh, sort of the tone curve and how that works. And a number of you will probably use that for quite a number of years. We're going to actually scroll past this because by set what I find by setting my white, my black points, and ensuring that my shadows are, are nicely exposed, is that actually in Lightroom I don't need to do a great deal on the tone curve at all. So I can actually skip through this. So again, this is something that Lightroom, its workflow has worked really well for me and simplified it. Uh, obviously we're talking through this presentation to give you a run through, but what I might do on, a, on an image myself, I was processing it, it might take me at the very most, if there was quite a lot of editing to do, 15 minutes. And, and for me, that's a very good sort of time turnaround in terms of what I'm spending at the PC compared to what I'm spending out of the camera. So here again, we move down, we can actually look at working with colours within the image itself. We've got a hue, saturation, and luminance settings, so where we can work on the actual, the colour, the colour balance of each colour, the colour depth, and the colour brightness of each colour within the image. Uh, we can also, currently on HSL, we can also move on to the colours, actually work on the colours individually, and it, really good tool in Lightroom here. If we click black and white, if we're certainly thinking about making an image black and white, this will give us a really good non-destructive visual representation of how the image might work in black and white. And we can do some black and white kind of conversion in here in Lightroom and, and actually very powerfully control each individual color channel and how it works with the light and how it works in its black and white conversion. Um, but it's not something we're going to do, so I'm going to go back to HSL. And what I might want to do is just again, just work with the nice colour tones up here. Now, we've got a really useful tool in Lightroom. It's called the Target Adjustment Tool just here. We click it, 
and what this allows us to do is hover over specific colors within the image and we can actually by holding our left button down and then moving the mouse either up or down we can increase for up and decrease based on the settings we have on the right hand side so here I'm going to be working with luminance that's the how the color works or, or its representation within light so we can brighten the color I'm going to click on the oranges in the foreground and what I might want to do is darken these down very slightly again just to and you can see how that works it takes quite a little bit of light out of there well, the, what I also might want to do is raise them and this again for me thinking back to the morning out on Skinning Grove Beach there's that lovely sunlight against on the Einstein cliffs as the, they had a really nice bright representation to me so I'm gonna I'm gonna raise these that little bit more just to and again you could go quite a way and it might take it too far so again like any of the sliders in Lightroom you've got to work with them quite sparingly so I'm just going to take it up a little bit and again what we might want to do is work with the saturation just on specific colors and again we've raised the oranges a little bit here just to replicate that lovely color tone that I actually saw on the hillside that morning so I'm pretty happy with that and then once you've done any settings in here you can click done uh, the other thing you can do you've got an on and off button which is excellent to actually see what you did so if you click off that literally so if we click off on off on carefully watching those cliffs we can actually see the effect that our editing has made quite minimal and very subtle but just enhancing so we'll make sure that's switched on the white button at the top means it's switched on I'll then move down again and split toning is something that I tend to do more so with black and white so again we can move through that one and we move on to our detail panel and this is where we're going to do our pre-sharpening so this is where we're going to again work as we know raw files come in from the camera and they do tend to be quite flat so we require some sharpening I might do this using the Nick tool if I'm going to be working a lot more in depth on an image but um, I found now that Lightroom certainly over the years has got much better. What I will tend to do is I'll use this crosshair here and I'll pick an area that I know has got some really interesting detail on it. And that will basically just give me a really close in view of that portion of the screen so we can see how the sharpening is affecting that portion only. What it is going to do is going to affect the whole image in the first instance but what I will show you is how to mask this out. Now I tend to set the radius, this is kind of how the, if you think about working in Photoshop, how your, your kind of pixel radius, so how how aggressive it is in terms of its sharpening. I'll set that down to about half and then again this is personal preference and just, a, just one way that I work. Uh, anybody who's watched any of Joe Cornish's processing videos again will see that it's something something Joe also does as he, as he sets his radius down to about half of what the standard is. Uh, again just purely because for his, his eye that is how he prefers the, the kind of to work with the, the, the sharpening tool in Lightroom. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're just going to look at our image as a whole and we've obviously got this targeted window here and we're going to apply the sharpening to it so I'm going to move my slider and again you've got to be quite you've got to be quite kind of reserved and, and very judgeful on this and make sure that you're not over sharpening the image because once you then create an output file as well and add that kind of output sharpening for different whether it be for screen or for a certain paper if you've over sharpened your image it can show up and it will it will certainly show up to the viewer uh, and certainly if, if we're creating a classic landscape image uh, an over sharpened image is, is possibly something we're not going for so each camera each image will have its own foibles in this respect so I'm going to just move the slide down I'll keep an eye on the main part of the image itself and my little target window just to see how the sharpening is affected now if I take it all the way down you see it goes quite blurry if I take it all the way up it's possibly a little bit uber sharp and you can start to see some kind of pixel 
dots on the screen but what you'll also notice if when I take it all the way up if you look on my image to the left you can see some red bits that have started to appear in the sea this is showing that we're starting to clip some of the highlights again in the brights of the water and by over sharpening this is something we can do so what I tend to do is I'll move it up nice and slowly just looking at all the elements in my scene until they're as sharp as I would like them and we're probably looking yeah, kind of high 70s, early 80s maybe for this image specifically. Looking at that, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that. Now, obviously to the human eye, when we look at an image, we know that rocks, buildings, uh, structure itself can be quite sharp. The landscape can be quite sharp. But what we do know is that the sky and water is not visually sharp to us, it's quite smooth and it's flowing and this is where we might want to mask out. Now in Photoshop we could apply selective sharpening and literally mask out some of these features but what again what Lightroom's done is made this really simple for us. So we're able to literally mask out parts of the scene that we don't want to be sharpened very easily. So again we press the Alt key and this, what this is going to do when we hold the left mouse button down it's going to turn the whole screen white now using the kind of Photoshop analogy here it's white to apply so what white's done is it means the sharpening is applied to the whole image so what we're going to do now is move the slider to the right which will bring in black and the black areas are areas that aren't sharpened so as we move this to the right we'll notice that the sky comes in black and we'll keep moving until we've got the areas unsharpened which we would like so I'll keep moving here. What, um, as I look at this, what, I, what I've got is a majority of the water is kind of unsharpened, barring the kind of detail, the rocks and some of the swirls. I've got a pretty much fully unsharpened sky, barring that cloud structure. And we've got some nice sharpening applied to the edges of the landscape with some unsharpened areas actually on the soft rolling portions of the landscape. We could push this a lot further. If you go there, there's very, very minimal sharpening applied. But uh, and again, this is this is where you've got to use your creative eye to apply the sharpening to the area you want it on. So we'll drop off here. And what that's done is it's now applied the sharpening that we applied to the whole picture. It's now masked it out on the areas that were black. So we've masked out most of the sky, the sort of softer areas of the water and some of the softer bits in between the detail and the landscape. So what this should help us do is create almost kind of three-dimensional feel to our image. So we scroll down again. And what we can do now is if we have introduced through our post-processing or the kind of shot we've made later in the evening uh, at a reasonably high so we tend to get a little bit of pixel noise sort of sparkly green red pixels that might appear we can actually reduce these very very effectively in Lightroom whether it be color noise or luminance noise and again it's just a case of using the sliders now on this in image it was shot in really good light it was shot at ISO 50 which is as low as the 5D Mark II will go and the, I'm pretty confident that there's going to be no noise in this image so it's something that I don't use very often certainly on a classic landscape because I'll be I'll be looking to get the settings right in camera for the best quality file that I can do of a classic landscape image. I'll then move down as you see we now come past our lens correction profile and, and we'll be kind of if, if we'd have been working in that sequential order we'd have then be going in and applying lens corrections to an image which we might have cropped already. So now we've done our basic editing this editing this is where we can decide what do we want to crop the image? Do we want to shape the image slightly differently? Now when I click on the crop button here you can see there'll be different overlays that are actually appearing in there. So and these can be used to help us understand the composition of our image. If we press the O button once we're in the crop tool here we get a grid appear. Now the default one which will come on with Lightroom, I'll take you back to it, will be the thirds. So that will give you the sort of standard 
divide the scene into thirds, which will allow you again, which can be really good for assessing whether you whether your horizon is straight. And as we can see here, we're just very slightly off, so we're straight in the just by dragging, the, clicking the left mouse button and dragging to the right hand side of the picture, moving the mouse down, we can start to straighten our, our horizon a little bit. If we're happy with that, we double click on it or we click the done button. And as I say, what we can also do is we can use this overlay tool by press cycling through the different overlays with the O key on the keyboard and it once in this mode and it will actually show us different ways to assess the image for composition. I'll say here we've got the kind of rule of thirds or principle of thirds, we don't like rules in this sense. We can have kind of angular, use a nice angular representation of the scene so we can we can look at how the flow of the image comes in. It gives it also gives us a very good central focus area here. We, we've got sort of offset triangles and again, this can be very good when you're actually composing an image in camera, is to try and actually replicate some of these kind of compositional tools for assessing the landscape actually into your mind's eye. So when you're actually working with the camera, you can see how it looks to you. And we've got slightly narrowed off almost third representations and we've also got a golden ratio again which can can be fantastic for for assessing different images so i'm going to take it straight back to our thirds that's certainly allowed me to line the horizon up i can also again if i was using the concept of thirds i can think about how my elements within the scene appear within this sort of zone so again we've got we've got a we've got a foreground could argue that it's a little bit corner based although my primary foreground I think is this lovely motion down here this is my primary foreground here it's this lovely motion and texture in the water I'm going to mid ground here which some the, the way the water was breaking on these lovely rocks and the light was catching them and then we've got our fog and then we've got our far ground our distance which was, again which was what caught my eye in the but in terms of a color colour combination within the scenes, the lovely blues and how the sun was setting on the ironstone cliffs. And so I can cycle through these different settings to apply to look at this and see how the image flows visually using different techniques to assess it. So here we're you know, using this kind of the offset sort of triangles I can see that the image kind of flows in from this left, follows up through the rocks and we've got, we've got a nice flow here through the foreground to the midground to the foreground and again we can we could use the golden ratio to see how we how the scene follows through here and it, it's introduced through these stones into this lovely texture in the water here we flow through picking up the color tones from the sky and concentrating finally on that lovely color balance on the ironstone in the distance so again i'm pretty happy with this i could crop this in tighter if we so desired um, but I think in this instance, um, I'm quite happy with it. I, d I think I think it's nice to have a little bit of blue sky up here to counterbalance the blue down here. I think if we brought it in a little bit too much, it might it might give it a little bit of squash. But again, this is personal preference. So I'm going to click done for now on here. I'm quite happy with that. Other things that we can actually do from here, certainly in Lightroom, uh, we can. If we've got so if we zoomed in on the image here, let's have a look. We can have a we can scroll our image around the scene and we can look for dust spots. We might decide we had dust spots on the scene. There's none that I'm actually too worried about. Now as we zoomed in on the scene, what you've what we can see here, uh, if I was looking at this on a big monitor, it'd be a little bit easier to show you. But when we zoomed in on the scene, I've actually used my, although I've used a reasonably mid aperture f11, I've actually used my depth of field and my focal, my sort of focal area and my, and my hyperfocal range quite creatively here. What we might tend to do is we might tend to set 
the scene and use that hyperfocal range just to get ultimate front to back sharpness. Uh, so what I'd have is some kind of maybe the rocks here wouldn't be as sharp, but everything maybe from the water here through the midground into the hillside and the cliffs in the foreground would be sharp. What I've actually done is when I assess this scene out on the landscape is that I was looking at the colour balances and the energy and the movement in the image. I decided that actually the, the colour balance was for me in the image was the lovely contrast between the blues and the oranges. So I wanted to represent that to start with. What I actually also wanted was this lovely detail in the water and the rocks in the foreground. And actually, in thinking about the scene, I actually assessed that actually to try and get too much detail in this foreground cliff and to push my hyperfocal point to get that detail actually wasn't, in this instance, wasn't that important to me. For me, the detail part of the image was here, but the importance to the scene of the kind of far of the far ground, the distance, was more about the colour than the actual detail. So what I've done here is I've obviously used my depth of field in a fairly mid zone, but I've actually pushed my hyperfocal point a little bit closer to me to bring the detail in in all this water, in these rocks, in these rocks, and sacrifice a little bit of detail out here and just use this as a colour area within the scene. Now this is me making a creative decision when I've actually framed and focused the image in camera. And different people will approach it different ways and you might, I might go back another time and the colour might not be the same. But only one, what I might do is set my hyperfocal range that little bit further back and get the cliffs in full sharpness as well. But certainly for this instance, for me, this image was more about the colour and the motion and the movement and the shapes. So we, we, what I've done is purposely sacrificed a little bit of sharpness on these hills. So we've had a look by and sort of zooming in to see if there's any dust spots. There might be sort of areas that you might also want to remove. I mean, I might have decided, well, I could kind of move that a bit of grass there. And certainly in Lightroom, you can use your spot removal tool. And what they've done now is they've given you an ability not just to make it round, or a circle, but you, what you can do is paint with it, almost like using the kind of content wear tool in Photoshop or the patch removal tool. So I'll literally click my left button and hold it on and literally move down here and paint over this little area. And what we see Lightroom does is it assesses for pixels around it and it will replace that little bit of kind of grass that was coming through with some watery pixels. And it's done a really good seamless job of actually doing it. It's very difficult to tell that it's actually done this edit. So which is the whole power of editing. I think any any editing you do post-processing in the camera, on a, certainly on a classic landscape image, you want it to be fairly seamless and not so much hidden. We're not trying to hide things from the viewer, but what we're trying to say is that my editing that I've applied to this classic landscape scene is not the noticeable point of the image. It's enhanced it, it's added to the overall quality, but it's not the viewer's focal point. They're not going, ah, this person's done this, they've done that. So we're going to keep the editing quite light. So that's one way, and we can certainly how we can use this immense kind of spot removal tool. I mean, we could, and, and this kind of an ethical question here, we might decide that, you know, this little rock here is it important to us? So we might decide we could paint this little bit of rock out from the sea. And we'll give Lightroom a moment to assess it. Click done and move out. And we can see Lightroom's replaced that. What we can also see though is because of maybe how it's created and done the pixels, it's a little bit of a, what we can do is also line these up click edit and undo there so we can ensure that our editing is how we want it to be again we click done what we can see though and, and certainly by zooming in on the image we can see where we've introduced areas of maybe over 
uh, so where we've pushed the the whites out a little bit too far so again what we can do here if I use the highlight shadow highlight slider and I move it to the right that's gonna oh that's, that was the exposure slider so if you get the highlight slider we move it to the left we'll see that little red area in the middle of the screen just disappear we can take that off and bring it back if we wish so we're just going to push that back until recovered these few highlights there we go thing to be that we've what we've got to think about is when we do assess the scene is that certain scenes you know if certainly if we're shooting in the golden or the kind of the light periods of day that early morning that late night when the light can be quite extreme in different times of year that there are going to be certain acceptances we've got to make in terms of what areas will be blown out and this is certainly one way if, if you introduce street lights or man-made lighting into a scene is that it's going to be very difficult to control the balance of the natural light and not have blown out highlights in street lighting and here we've sometimes we've just got to hold our hands up and say actually I can't control the street lighting and you know it is visually if, if we thought if we think about it ourselves visually as well we'd look at the street light and it would be quite blown out so what we'll try and do is we'll apply our editing and get the the majority of the image that is within our control to the state we want it as we move across here as well We've also got a red eye reduction tool. Again, it's good if you're working with portraits. Very rarely use it there, I must admit. And we've got a graduated tool, uh, which is brilliant. Again, if you've if you've worked with an image and in camera you don't have any filters, again you can actually apply editing to a, on a graduated effect to this image. So what I'm going to do is maybe do I want to darken this sky down that little bit more? I could literally click my left button once I'm on the graduated filter drag it down a bit what I might do is I'll select the mid area for me on the horizon and what it's going to do because it's a graduated filter is it's going to apply more of the effect to the top and less to the bottom area here below so what I might want to do is decide to I want to drop the exposure at the top of the scene a little bit so again we could do that I mean, again here we can be quite aggressive if we really wanted to but what you've got to think about is the visual color balance and the and the visual reality in this scene and we could take it the other way so what i'm maybe going to do so if, again if you don't like it double click it it'll take the slider back to the middle i'm going to just kind of a little bit of darkness down in there just take off a tiny bit and uh, again this is more for just to demonstrate the features rather than how I might specifically process image what we can also do using this top panel and and this kind of mirrors something that we might be doing further down is we can think about an image or portions and elements with image as when we're thinking about how we compose images and what elements are important to us we can actually use this um, radial filter tool uh, to actually focus the viewer and their vision and where they're looking into the image onto certain portions of the image so if we wanted these rocks here to be a little bit brighter we could click our radial filter we could bring it down over these rocks Make sure it's got the right setting and we could literally raise the exposure what we do, the first thing we do is click invert mask. So that's going to affect the area inside rather than outside of the radial filter. And we click and we could raise the exposure here specifically everywhere within that circle. Again, you've got to be quite careful on this. So exposure, I tend not to use. What I might tend to do is lift the shadows that little bit more just to bring detail back on those rocks. And that's to see we've brought a little bit more detail on these rocks without kind of blowing out any of these highlights in the water again I'm going to click done on this I'm quite happy with that so that's that little edit done there we can use this radio radial filter tool as, as an overall creation of a, of a vignette within the image so if we didn't invert the mask we could darken the outside and we can be quite targeted in where we placed our 
our vignette rather than using the standard vignette tool. So if we're happy with all the editing we've done along there, we, we do have a final tool at our disposal, which can be very, very powerful. Absolutely stunning tool. If we click on the adjustment brush tool, and this allows us to paint, paint onto the scene. And again, can be certainly really, really powerful if we just want to paint a little bit of colour back into this scene. So, and again, and this is very much like working in Photoshop. So I can, what I can do here, before I actually apply any edit into this, is I almost paint in the area that I know I want to affect. So I bring a little bit of colour back into these clouds. Bring a little bit of colour back into the water here as well. And what we'll do now is I can actually think, how can I bring some colour back into this? So what I could do is I could just kind of change my temperature very, very slightly. So again, we just, here we just try and replicate that lovely colour tone that the, that the sun was giving us on these cliffs. And I'll try and replicate this into the clouds by literally warming this little bit of the scene up a little bit. And again, you've got to be quite sparing on how you do this, because if you pushed it too far, it would look really, really quite odd. And if you went the other way, you could create a really queer image. So it's, again, it's about trying to represent reality, certainly in a classic landscape image. So I'm just going just gonna to get the colour balance just right for me. So just move these sliders. So I think I'm happy at that. And what we've done is we've just enhanced sort of the lovely warm orange lights that were on the clouds and the reflections here that were also in the water and have kept them so tonight the shadow areas that were being cast by the pier or by the jetty we've left them that little bit bluer so once we're happy with that we click done obviously you can imagine if you're doing some real fine-tuned head editing on a whole image that selection brush could be really powerful in that you can also create more than one. So we've got one here, we, we go into the tool again and we would click new and we can actually create a second one. So if we decide, oh I didn't like that, we can actually start to paste out, paint out some of that colour as well. And we can bring in, we can add contrast to certain areas, we can add clarity, we can add more sharpness. So again we're, we're, we're painting, we're masking areas, something that traditionally we might have done in Adobe Photoshop, but Lightroom, certainly Lightroom 5, has made so much easier for us. So I'm going to click Done. I'm quite happy with this. I'll then scroll down. We've gone past lens corrections and we've had that discussion about where it should have been. And I'll now finally think, do I want a vignette? Do I want to concentrate the viewer's eye into this image? Is this something I want to do? And I say, we could have used the radial filter tool for this, or we could use the standard vignette. And what I tend to do is I'll, I'll have a look at how the vignette works. And, the, and again, this is a tool that if you're quite aggressive, it looks daft. But if you use it very sparingly, then just gently, gently, just use it to shape the viewer's eye in your image. You can just add that little bit of focus to the viewer and to where you want to guide them through your image. So by sort of bringing it in a little bit, we've darkened the effect of these waves here. We've little brought the sky in a little bit more. So what we're doing here is we're sort of bringing the viewer into this scene and they're kind of coming in, they're following the curve through this lovely texture in the water here. They're following the curve onto this rock. They're picking up this lovely light as they go. And then they're replicating this and they're going round in. So we're almost getting a nice sort of curve into the scene and they're following the bay. They've got this lovely light on the, in the horizon. Again, this is something that you will you will start to define yourself. The more editing and the more kind of used to editing you do, is you'll start to work out what things you want to actually process onto your image to actually create and, and replicate that vision that you actually had on location and prior to going there in your mind. And this is where we're using Lightroom, not just as a, an image processing and spit the image out tool but we're using it very we can use it very creatively to to create and shape our end vision and finally we've now obviously we've done our editing on the image quite happy with it 
final thing we would do, I'd literally flick across to the library module once more. I'd go into title and I'd give my image a title. So I'm going to call this one Skinny Grove Sweep. And again, that's possibly just something that's come in with the sweep through this image, replicating the sweep of the waves. Um, and here you can add on data that's going to be hard coded into the image when it actually creates your JPEG or your TIFF file. And this is where I certainly put in copyright status. So if you're posting your images on Flickr or Twitter or Facebook or 500 pixels or you know online anywhere, you should try and ensure that you actually hard code some, da some data about who you are as a photographer into this image, not only for your own purposes, so when you look at it, you can see where it was taken, what your camera settings were, etc, etc. But for anybody who finds this image, maybe online on an image search, it comes up in Google, and you, you know, and you, you get a company, you might think, oh, that's a, we'd love to use that image for our greetings card. If you've hard coded this data into there, it becomes much harder for a reputable company at least, to actually not say, right, I know who took this photograph, so I've got to make every effort to contact them to actually do this properly. You can also add here, yeah, your location details. I tend to use in the label section, I tend to have a setting where I put in a contact email address in, so this goes back to the point of giving the anybody who finds this Im image online who might want to use it, every opportunity to contact you. So I'm quite happy with everything I've done there. Again, I'll just flick back to develop, double check that I'm happy with it. I think I am. I'll then literally go to file and I will go to export. And this is the final part. Everything else we've done on this image has been non-destructive. So we still have the royal raw file to work with. Everything we've done has been completely non-destructive. Lightroom applies a set of instructions based on your editing to the image file and it gives you a visual representation. But until you export it to a JPEG, you do, it's not creating that final file for you. I'm just going to click cancel a minute because talking about these instructions, if we look down the left panel here, we can see everything that we've actually done and the good thing about this history is that we can absolutely move all the way back to the start or to the end or any point within our editing process so if we didn't like something we did we can literally just move back to another point within our history and we can recover everything we did the final thing I might do once again is before we spit this image out uh, as a JPEG or a TIFF, is I might press F to go full screen, just again to allow me to look at the image itself without any of the toolbars and panels at the side, and to ensure that I'm fully happy with all the editing that I've completed and I've not missed anything. Again, I think I'm quite happy with that, so I'll press F, and we will go into the port, I mean the portion now where we do an export. So we have file export we choose where we want to save the file to so I'm going to put it in the same whether it goes in the same folder as the original or you have an output folder processed pictures whatever you want to do down to this file naming I go to edit I can choose my file name skinny grove sweep This is where we come down to our file settings. So you can spit it as a JPEG, a PSD, a TIFF, a DNG, or keep it as the original raw. I'm going to spit, given that we're going to, I'm going to use this one for web, so I'm going to spit it as a JPEG, keep the quality 100%. Again, you could drop that quality to about sort of 60, 70% for web happily. If you were exporting this file out for Camera Club, again, you might want to keep it as high as possible. Another thing you certainly might want to do if you're sending images off to competition, to a, to a certain websites or for Camera Club and their kind of image presentation software that they use, is you might have specific kind of pixel ratios that you have to set 
on certain edges. And again, this can be a great way to also, once you've created an initial file, if you then need a, a slightly smaller one for a certain purpose, you can actually resize this very easy. And here where you click the resize, and you've got a choice of long edge, width and height, short edges, pixels. I find the long edge one really useful and you just type in the, the long edge. So if it's kind of camera club and it met the, the image presentation software that they used for competitions was, so it had to be 1024, I would literally just enter 1024 into there. I'm not gonna use that bit for now. Resolution is your final output resolution of your image. Now, what I might wanna do is just say, well, I'm, I'm creating this JPEG. Yes, it could be for the web, but I'm, you know, I might want to print from it. So I'm going to create it at the highest quality and I'll keep my resolution high. You could quite happily, if you're doing this just for the web, set that instead of at 300, 300 plus, you could set that at 72 and it would be fine. Again, that's another way of discouraging people from stealing your images on the web. Here we can do our output sharpening. So this is sh the final bit of sharpening on the image that Lightroom will apply. I often use uh, Nixoffs or Google Nix um, Sharpener Pro for this uh, because it does have a few more extra settings although I find that you've got settings for screen matte paper and glossy paper so on the whole it will do a good job for most people and again I, I tend not to do too much extra sharpening maybe if it's for if it's something that's going to be printed quite large and the viewer's going to stand quite a way back to view it, I might increase the sharpening that little bit, but invariably I'll keep it on standard. We don't need to touch anything else down here. If you did want to add a watermark over the image, it doesn't apply it to the to your actual raw file. This is just on the output JPEG, you can create a watermark. Again, it can be quite opaque, but it's just something that stops or discourages people from stealing your images online if you post them online or not. If you're happy with everything here, you can choose whether you want to, it to pop up or open in Photoshop or whatever. I'm going to click do nothing for now. And we literally just click export. Lightroom will now do its jiggery pokery. There we go. We see it's just a task completed up here. And that will have exported that file for us. So we can now go into our, not our web page, into our finder folder and find the drive. And find our images. And we have a look. And we'll find out which specific folder that I actually took this one out of. There we go, so if I come down here, we've got Skinning Grove Sweep, I can double click on that, and that is my final JPEG. And there we go, just make this full screen. And there is our final JPEG we've created from Lightroom. Say, so with talking through the process, it, it seems a lot longer than it is, but once you get sort of quite happy with Lightroom and it doesn't take too long, you'll find you're probably spending five, 10 minutes an image maximum. So if you've got a lot of images from a location, just to do that final bit of editing, here we can see that Lightroom has certainly given you some powerful editing tools in a very, very quick space of time. And that is how we would work through Lightroom on a quick end-to-end -end process and processing your files. Thank you very much. For more information, certainly visit the website www.rkphotographic.com. Drop us an email at learning at rkphotographic.com. Or you can follow us on Twitter, where we are at rk, capital R, capital K, photographic. Thank you very much, and we'll see you again another time.